Brothers and sisters, we want to welcome you to our first virtual leadership enrichment series. In addition to the small gathering here, uh, socially distanced or physically, physically distanced, uh, we also have today uh, streaming into this broadcast about 7,000 uh, employees and service missionaries uh, here in the U.S. and internationally. So to all of you throughout the world, welcome here uh, to this Leadership Enrichment Series. We um, also will be uh, doing live interpretation uh, in Portuguese and Spanish for our large contingency, particularly in South America, and we're grateful for that. And of course, after this session is over, uh, we'll have that uh, translation work done so that we'll be able to provide transcripts uh, uh, in different languages throughout the world. We want to give a special welcome to Elder Bednar, uh, who's joined us here today of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and also want to recognize Sister Bednar, who's joining us here as well. So thank you for being with us, and we're really excited to, to uh, have this conversation. We want to begin this session of the Leadership uh, Enrichment Series with a special musical number. Uh, it will be sung by uh, brother uh, and sister Doug uh, Fermet, Furness um, and uh, Doug and Jill Furness. Uh, they're both in the Tabernacle Choir and will be accompanied by Steve Witt. The song is called Learn of Me, focusing on Doctrine and Covenants 19, verse 23, which hopefully in your studies and your preparation you have come across and thought about and pondered. Learn of me. Listen to my words, walk in the meekness of my uh, spirit, and you shall have peace in me. There's a lot in that, and I think it will be expressed in the song that we'll have. Following uh, their uh, sharing of their talent, we have asked uh, Brother Menon, uh, who is an engineering manager in the ICS department, if he would open up uh, with a word of prayer. from the strife now I must face whatever foes may come and fight with strength until the battle's won I tremble fear the task is far too great on every side the tempter lies in wait what can I do? I plead to him above. Then hear him speak these gentle words of love. Learn of me and listen to my word. Walk in the meekness of my life, and I will give love will never cease, for I am Jesus Christ. When I was yet a child so clean and pure, I doubted not and knew God's love was sure. I knew he lived for every Yes, 
Our dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful that we are able to learn of thee, Father. Through our covenant with thy Son, and even to love as thou lovest us, we are so grateful that we know of thy sure love, that it is born to us through the atonement of thy Son. We love him so dearly and pray that we may be able to learn to walk in the meekness of his spirit. We are grateful that we have been counseled by Elder Bednar this day to prepare for this gathering. That through gatherings such as these, we may carry forward thy work to gather thy children even Israel. Father, we are thankful also for Brother Porter and his testimony of the importance of preparation for this meeting, and we have felt like him in our weakness, the need for us to grow in meekness. And we pray, Father, throughout this proceedings and whenever we return to learn of thee, and remember the words we will learn today, that we may find an increase in love for one another. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you for your prayer and your words. Uh, for Jill and Doug, thank you, Steve. And uh, certainly helped to usher in the spirit in our session here today. Well, Elder Bednar, uh, it seems like you have been with us about every five years. Uh, we started when the leadership pattern was first developed 10 years ago, believe that or not. You were one of the co-creators uh, of that. You joined us then. Five years ago, you were with us, and we talked a bit about building uh, leadership capability, building people capability. And then you're obviously here in 2020, so about every five years. So. We not only thank you for 
be willing, being willing to be here today, but we thank you for your willingness to keep coming back. So thank you. I'm kind of like a bad dream that just keeps coming back. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's probably more than that. But uh, I, I, you had warned me when we had met that this session may be a little bit different and that you might throw some questions out or do things a little bit differently. And so I just wanted to start that, you know, that different approach. And I wanted to share something with you that, that I think is important for all to hear, but for Elder Bednar to hear, and that is, is that of the 7,000 uh, folks who have registered to be on the session here today on the live broadcast, we also gave you an opportunity to be able to write in and share with us your preparations for this session. And what I wanted to hear from you, uh, or share with you, Elder Bednar, of the thousand some odd that sent their comments in, after reading them, there's clearly some common themes. And this is what the themes would be. One that I clearly resonated myself was, I feel like I have so far to go to get to this point of meekness. And you could feel the... Not the anxiety, but just, you know, the frustration, the everyday life, the, you know, just I want it, but I'm not there yet. So that was one that just kind of came out altogether. Two was there was a genuine expression of we want to know more about the Savior, of who he is. And as one person expressed it, we've been taught in the scriptures and Doctrine and Covenants 101 that we should seek always the face of the Lord. So there's a real desire on the part of those who are with us today to learn more and to continue the journey of not only becoming like him, but to one day to be able to see his face. And then, not that it was expressed by each of the individuals, but you could tell as you read the comments collectively that there was a large group of people who did exactly what you suggested that they do, invited them to do, which was to pay the price, to prepare themselves for this discussion. So I kind of wanted to throw it out. This wasn't a question that we had even thought about or whatever, but I just wanted to throw out if you had any reactions to their preparation or their desires in terms of this particular session? I do. Um, and it will come in the form of a paradox. And the paradox is, I hope no one will listen to or pay much attention to anything that you and I say today. <laughs> it's quite customary when we come to a learning session like this that we take copious notes and people should take notes, but if they write down what either one of us say, I would suggest that is really missing the mark. The mark is the Savior. And by the power of His Spirit, by the power of the Holy Ghost, today, people that have that yearning. See, I don't think it was a frustration. It's a yearning to know what, what lack I yet. And I certainly can't answer that question for people. Only he can by the power of his spirit. I trust that all of us have had the experience of being in a gathering and someone is teaching and testifying of truth. And we have received answers to questions that had absolutely nothing to do with what the speaker was talking about. Hopefully that's what's going to happen today. Um, the preparation that people took to be ready for today, our job, you and me, is to not mess that up. <laughs> because much of the really good stuff that people need to learn, they've already learned. It will be enlarged upon here today. That's the reason why the preparation is so important. Faith in the Savior is a principle of action and of power. We act in accordance with His teachings then we are blessed with his power. Sometimes people think, well, I'll pray for the power and then I'll act. I hope I don't sound sarcastic or, or inappropriate, but good luck getting that prayer answered. You have to act first and then the power comes. So these good folks who've worked so hard to prepare, 
are a long way down the road. And if they listen to us, it will get in the way. But as we try to emphasize that which is true and right, and the Holy Ghost bears witness of that, then the Holy Ghost as a teacher will bring to each individual that portion that is needful for him or her. So my prayer is that no one will remember anything that we say, but they will always remember the things that they were given individually and personally and privately and in a sacred way by the Holy Ghost. Good. Good start here. Um, let me just share with you our tentative format. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> and the format, a little bit different than our traditional leadership enrichment series. But what we want to do is that I'll probably start out with, with a question or two uh, with uh, Elder Bednar. But he has opened this up uh, to you asking questions any time during this session. So we're not going to go an hour and a half of me asking questions and then another hour or whatever the time of 45 minutes of you asking questions. If you feel prompted to ask a question anytime, you ought to do so. Now, for those who are here in this audience, it's just raising your hand and the mic will be coming around to you. You won't be able, you won't be given the mic. They will hold on to that. Um, and you just ask the question. For those of you who are around the globe and listening right now, you should see across your screen the information of where you can email or text Elder Bednar. And on his magic iPad, it will be picked up and he will be able to respond to it as we go on to that. So you should be ready to make this very interactive from the very beginning. We'll go until we feel like we've learned, you know, our cup is full, runneth over. But we would like to for sure reserve 10 or 15 minutes at the end of our discussion here for Elder Bednar to share any last thoughts or counsel for us, as well as his testimony of the Savior. We would really appreciate that. OK, so why don't we get started? I'll just start it out with the first question, and, and that is this, is that so Elder Bednar, you know that over the last 10 years in this leadership pattern, we identified nine talents. Uh, one of them that gets a lot of attention and that we focus on is called lead like the Savior. And we love that one because it helps us to focus on what we're doing right here. And it was a long time ago, it seems, this is all before COVID took place, that you and I had a conversation. And we talked about the leadership pattern and we talked about potentially talking about lead like the Savior. And it was at that time, I recall, that we just said, Elder Bednar, what we'd like to do is we'd like to learn more about the Savior, you know, about becoming like Him and, and feeling Him more. And it didn't take you long at all where you brought up, it's all about meekness. And you read a scripture to me and, you know, we were off and running from there. So you had made the point that of all kind of that we could have talked about in terms of lead like the Savior, meekness was kind of number one on your hit list, so to speak. My question to you is, why meekness? Why is that so important to you? You've spoken about it in general conference a couple of years ago. It's a big deal for you. Why? First, the prophet Joseph Smith said that in order to exercise faith in God unto life and salvation, three things are required. One, we must accept the idea that God exists. Two, we need to have a correct that's the, that's the operative word. We need to have an, a correct understanding of the nature, attributes, and character of God. And third is that we have a sure knowledge that the path we are pursuing in this life is in accordance with God's holy mind and will. That notion of the attributes and the character of God and of the Savior has intrigued me literally for decades. Um, a related issue is that as I study the scriptures, I look for sequences and relationships. Sequence is instructive. So if we want to know the, the most monumental aspects of the restoration, the first vision, it's called the first for a reason. We learn about the true nature of God that the three members of the Godhead are separate and distinct beings 
and that the Father and the Son have tangible, perfected bodies of flesh and bone. That came first. What came second? The Book of Mormon. What came third? Priesthood. That's very instructive to just note the sequence. If you take, for example, I'm going to go for a minute. This, you're going to think I'm not answering your question, but I am. If you want to know what the Savior thinks is important, it's patentedly obvious in the scriptures if we look for sequence and relationships. In the old world, he said to his apostles, my time is at hand. Now, I'll pose questions. I don't want you to answer them, but just so everyone will think. What is he telling them when he says, my time is at hand? In essence, he's saying, I will soon leave. I'm soon going to die. Is it reasonable to assume that knowing he now has very little time left, that what he teaches will be extraordinarily important? I think that's a very reasonable assumption. Question, what's the first thing he did after he said that? Now, don't answer, just think. He instituted the sacrament. It's an ordinance. Go now in the Book of Mormon to the temple at the land of Bountiful. He appears to the people. What's the first thing he does? Now, we all remember that he's introduced by his father. His father bears witness of him. He bears witness of himself. The people come forward and feel the prince in his hands and feet and the wound in his side. And then he confers priesthood authority. He clarifies the proper mode of baptism, and he teaches people that there should be no contention. Question, what's the first thing he did? Priesthood authority and an ordinance. Now, if any of us want to know what the Savior really thinks is important, it's evident in the sequence in those two episodes. In the ordinances of the priesthood, the power of godliness is made manifest. And without the ordinances of the priesthood and the authority thereof, the power of godliness is not made manifest unto men and women in the flesh. I don't know everything that's in the power of godliness, but I think the blessings of the atonement are a part of it. That's why he came. We can't have access to those blessings in the fullest possible measure unless we receive the saving ordinances and remember and live and honor the associated covenants. So in all of these instances, sequence is very instructive. The sequence of the covenants in, in the temple is instructive. Sacrifice is a lesser law preparation. It's not a lesser law, but I mean a preparatory law, lesser law administered in the authority of the Aaronic priesthood. Consecration is the culmination. In a similar kind of way, there's a sequence. Humility is dependence upon God and acknowledging that. And we read in the scriptures about people who are compelled to be humble because of their poverty. In the same way that consecration is a capstone and encompasses sacrifice, meekness is a capstone and encompasses humility. It is possible to be humble, but not be very far along on the pathway to meekness. But if one is meek, you have to be humble. So there's a sequence and a relationship to these things. And the Savior, if you find all the places where he describes himself, not in every instance, but in many of them, meekness is always first. So as I looked for those sequences, as I'm studying the scriptures, I said, why is that one first? So that's why I have gravitated to that. If you think about what Joseph said, we can't exercise faith in him unless we have a correct understanding of his nature, attributes, and character. And he seems to place a pretty high priority on that one. I sometimes wonder, you know, my, and I'm sure we're all like this, and our inten uh, intentions of becoming more like the Savior and I need to have more faith, or I need to have more love and charity or whatever, that maybe there's a sequence here too as well that maybe we learn and maybe we get better than those, 
but maybe it would have gone all the better if we would have started with meekness first, because I think that's in Moroni, where it says, you know, meekness comes before faith or comes before hope or charity or whatever, something like that. But I don't know if we can. I don't know that there's a, a predictable, necessary sequence. I think it comes line upon line, precept upon precept, in the same way that I'm not sure we understand consecration until we first understand sacrifice. I think there's a series of attributes that we have to both learn about and gain experience with before we begin to really appreciate and understand with the help of the Spirit what meekness is. Okay. Well, this now, might... Can I just add one oh, other Oh, sure. Thing? Yeah. In your comment about, you know, we want to develop more faith and we want to develop more charity or whatever the attribute might be. Um, I wish some of my brethren were here so they could correct me if what I'm saying is wrong. I think if we want to obtain those, those are spiritual gifts. They're not traits that we develop. They are, you know, it talks about charity possessing us. I think that's true of most spiritual gifts. So if my motive is, I want this for me, I suspect that guarantees we won't get it. If I understand anything about spiritual gifts, we only can receive them if God trusts us to be in the right place at the right time, having been influenced by him, so that if we are blessed with the gift, it then comes to and through us to bless somebody else. Now, in the process, we are magnified and we are blessed. But if our ultimate motive is, I want it for me, I don't think it happens. So you and I both have experience in trying to help people and organizations develop skills. This is not like that. This is a surrender of what we want, when we want it, how we want it. And in that submissiveness, which is one of the elements, I think, of meekness, then we say to him, make of me what you will. And then the experiences come that we would never volunteer for that teach us the lessons. Okay. So, Elder Bednar, and I'll ask, and then we'll look and see if there's some questions coming through. I want to encourage that to happen here. But I'll just throw this out there as kind of a ground setting here. In our preparations, you know, your messages to us, others of the brethren's messages to us, you know, of what meekness is, what meekness is not. And maybe it's my hang up in life that I'd like to make you know, a list of both and then kind of analyze it or whatever. But there's a lot out there. And, you know, and, and I think of the world, their definition of meekness may be different. I would love for you to just share with us how you size it up. How, I don't know if there's such thing as certain buckets or categories or whatever, but what is meekness from your perspective? How would you define it? Well, one of the very first questions is, what have you learned about being meek by watching the prophets you have served with? Um, I'll give one example. Uh, and Elder Hales may not be pleased if I do this, but um, I'm going to do it anyway. Elder Robert Hales was a remarkably capable, competent man. Now, he was a spiritual giant, but at a very young age, uh, he was a CEO of a major corporation. He was a jet fighter pilot. He was a tremendous athlete. So if anybody ever had it all together, it was Robert Hales. Plus, he married one of the sterling women in the history of the earth. So he and his wife were the total package. The older he got and the more physically restricted he was, he wasn't able to travel. He wasn't able to do all of the things that he had always done. But his influence on the church is monumental, and no one will ever know. And he doesn't want him to know. I'm not going to talk about what he did. But there were things that he, in the course of his lifetime, in his relationships, in his ministry as a member of the Twelve, connections and relationships where he could make phone calls and open doors that nobody else on this planet could do. 
uh, he was my neighbor. So I don't claim to have a, a, a huge backstage knowledge, but I have a little bit. And I know some of what he did that no one will ever know. Uh, I think all of us, the natural man, the natural woman in all of us wants to get credit for what we do. And what I saw in Elder Hales was he didn't need the credit. He didn't want the credit. He went out of his way to make sure that no one knew some of the things that he had helped to make happen that have had a huge impact on this church. Another example is if you take President Nelson, he was serving as the president of the Quorum of the Twelve when President Monson admonished us to study the Book of Mormon. And he is immediately doing it. And I use this illustration in my talk. If there's anybody on planet Earth who could have said, yeah, this one's not quite for me. That thought would never occur to him. And it, I frankly think that when I used him as an example in my talk, he was puzzled like, well, David, this is what most people do. <laughs> he doesn't see himself as being, he just sees himself as being regular, if that makes any sense. So one of the, you know, a question that people always ask is, what would meekness look like in the workplace? And the answer is, if you could see it, it's not meekness. If, if it's that demonstrable, then that may not be what it is. The restraint that's a part of meekness. The Savior, imagine having created this earth and Lucifer in Matthew chapter 4 offers to give him stuff. And he could have just swatted that away and he doesn't. The Savior is accused falsely and he responds in silence. Now, I can't speak for anybody else, but I have a long way to go before I don't have that desire to want to fire back when somehow I've been wronged. So one of the things about it is that you don't see it, which may be why people think it's weak when it's the ultimate in strength. Okay. I, I, you know, I think that we're caught up in a little bit of a paradox because we always say, well, you know, what does it look like and how is it demonstrated? And then you just shared with us that you probably don't see it. Can you go just a tad deeper on that, you know, to, you know, for all of us who are striving to have that more and to do that more, you've obviously got to do something. Maybe not. I don't know. Well, let me give a short answer for a change on this one. The people who know and love us the best will see the changes. Hmm. See, my wife is the one. You know, I might think I'm making a little progress, but if I think that, then I'm not making much progress. <laughs> but the one who would see it, my, my wife would see me respond in a wide variety of settings under very different circumstances over an extended period of time. And she knows me better than I know me. But when that changes, she's a pretty good witness that something's happening. Um, and I think in the workplace, it's the evolution, it's the development, it's the growth, it's the change over time. It's not a behavior that you can see, but it's a, uh, a developing, uh, a, a maturing spiritually that others who know us probably can see. I think you put self-restraint in that category. So self-restraint, maybe you can't see that all, all so well. It's just what people... No, hopefully, if you're going like this, <laughs> and that's, uh, you know, my self-restraint, I'm not doing very well. But no, I think that's one where it happens and nobody knows but heaven and you. Okay. Well, look, I, I, this is a recommendation here. I'd love to, you know, not wait to the end, but do as we had talked about. Just open it up to the audience if you have any questions, particularly about the definition and helping to better understand it. Please stand up and we'll bring the microphone to you. And for those of you who are around the globe, feel free to, you know, text or email uh, to Elder Bednar. We'll take some time to talk about kind of what meekness is.
So Elder Maxwell said that it's that meekness is a facilitator in the development of all the other Christ-like virtues. And you were just talking about you don't really see meekness, but you would see an increase of those other virtues as you increased in meekness. So could you speak a little bit of how meekness maybe is a fulcrum or a balancing point between even contradictory virtues of the Savior? Like he's 100% merciful and he's 100% just, and I think it's meekness that allows him to do that. Or he's 100% strong and 100% gentle. And so how is meekness that facilitator, that fulcrum that allows us to balance these other attributes that we're trying to get that maybe you do see? Uh, keep the microphone. Let me start, and then we'll just see if I'm uh, missing or getting anywhere close to your question. The reason I think meekness is the facilitator, as Elder Maxwell said, is that it seems to be so characteristic of the Savior's character. The natural man and the natural woman is self-centered and selfish. We turn in. And for me, the ultimate illustration, the behavioral uh, example of uh, that selfishness of the natural man is the cookie monster on Sesame Street. I want cookie now. <laughs> Give it to me. And what does he do when he gets them? You know, he's just shoving them in his mouth and the crumbs are flying. We are to put off the natural man and become a saint through the atonement of Christ. We don't do that by goal setting. We don't do that by determination. We do that in the grace of Christ, which helps us to be transformed into new creatures. And the man or woman of Christ turns out instead of in. In part, that's what it means to put off the natural man and become a saint. So if you go to the episode, I think this is one of the absolutely defining characteristics of the Savior. In Matthew chapter 4, given the encounter with Lucifer, and there's always a discussion about the three different temptations turn the stones to bread, cast yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple, and then I'll give you all these things, okay? There are not three temptations, there's just one. Deny yourself. Don't be true to who you are as the Son of God. Do it for you. The temptation is for the Son of God to become a natural man and be focused on what he wants for him. At the end of that episode, now he'd been for, fasting for 40 days and for 40 nights. I don't know what that means for the Son of God, but he may have been fatigued physically and very hungry. And he probably was spiritually and emotionally spent to a degree, given this encounter with the adversary. Now, I don't know about any of you, but at the end of that, I probably would have thought, now, can I just have a break here for a few minutes? You know, I've kind of been through this. And this, the 11th verse says, and the devil departed, and angels came and ministered unto him. Now, most of us would interpret that to mean that in this state of spiritual spentness and physical uh, fatigue. Angels came and ministered to him. If you go to the bottom of the page and read the Joseph Smith translation, what it says is, and he, Jesus, sent John, sent angels to John who was in prison and they ministered unto him. At that point in his life, that may have been the most physically, spiritually demanding thing he had experienced to that point in his life. And in the midst of it, he takes care of John. That's him. He's not worried about him. It's him. It's that turning out. All of that background is for it's the turning out that I think makes it the facilitator. The more we are turning away from self and to loving, blessing, and serving others, then all of those other attributes find their place. Help me know if that's responsive or did I miss the mark? 
Can I? Yes. I mean, it's a great answer. I just was. So would you say that in the Pahoran example that you used, that Moroni was just as meek? I mean, he's turning out. He's worried about his people. He's, he's worrying. So Pahoran is meek in his response that he doesn't rail on and say, hey, what are you doing? Because he doesn't, he's looking out. Moroni's looking out and is meek. And the reason I say that is because, especially in the workforce and when we're doing things at home, different reactions are meek in and of, are meek even though they could be opposite reactions based on who we're looking out to. Mm -hmm. They're not meek if I'm looking about myself and thinking about me. Is that what you're saying? That's a part of it. Meekness often is silent. Uh, does any, do any of us ever want to talk in a meeting, not because we have something to say, but because we want to be heard and we want some airtime and I'm trying to impress somebody. The most impressive thing is that when you speak, you say something that's very re relevant and has an impact, not simply that you're taking up airtime. So the only one who knows what's going on with the silence is you in heaven. Does that make any sense? That makes a lot of sense. Uh, listening. See, I don't want to give behavioral indicators because then people try to mimic those behavioral indicators and they think, well, that's meekness. But if one internally is turning out, you listen differently. And it's not an interpersonal skill. It's the gift of discernment. You're seeking that gift so you can hear what is not said with spiritual ears and see what can't be seen with natural eyes. Not because you want that for you, but because that will help you in, in your relationship with this person and helping that individual to grow and develop. Discernment at its highest level of manifestation is seeing the good in someone else that he or she has never seen in himself or herself. And it's the ability to help them identify and develop it. But see, part of the prerequisite for that is meekness. So meekness is almost, and you kind of mentioned this, it's that quality that allows us to open up and use what we've been given to help others without caring about the credit because I just want to help and I love others. Is that an accurate statement? I, I think that's headed down the right trail. I don't know if it's accurate because I don't know if I'm accurate. But I think it's headed down the trail. That's why if you go back to that whole notion of the turn from self to the Savior. Now, repentance means turn. When we sin, we turn away from God back to self. When we repent, we turn away from self back to God. All sin is selfish, selfish. So that whole process of turning, covenants help us. They, they provide the access to the power of godliness so that we have strength beyond our own to sustain the turn. Or if we make mistakes and we turn back, then we return to God again. As long as it's facing towards him, then we're not doing it for the credit. We're not doing it because I want people to know how cool I am. We're doing it for him. It's a great question. Now, my hope is that you didn't listen to anything that I said, but you're examining yourself. And in that process, the Holy Ghost is identifying, pointing out, helping each of us to see our true motives. Uh, I don't know if I've ever said this before in these uh, seminars, but I'm going to say it. And if I did it once before, I don't repent. <laughs> the Holy Ghost is a revealer of all truth. Truth is knowledge of things as they were, as they will be, and as they really are. Now, I would suggest that the natural man or the natural woman in each of us is very good at hiding from things as they really are. And we rationalize and we justify and we make excuses and we hide from stuff 
that we don't want to know about ourselves. And if we have a, a real intent to learn, and if we're willing, the Holy Ghost will help us see the way we really are. That's the ultimate in uh, executive development. And the only place it can work is when you have the companionship of the Holy Ghost. And it's brutal and it's liberating in the same moment. The stuff that we try to hide from, uh, you can't hide from. Uh, if you have children, when you were a child, if you have siblings, did you know the buttons to push on your siblings so that they would go crazy? Did you ever push one of those buttons and then try to pretend to your parents that you didn't push the button? You're lying to yourself, and we've all done that. Now, whenever you pray and ask for the companionship of the Holy Ghost, you'll be rebuked. And the Holy Ghost won't yell at you, but the Holy Ghost will say, you're a hypocrite. You did this, it brought contention into your family, and you did it on purpose. And now you're asking me for the companionship of the Holy Ghost? Well, yeah, we should ask. But boy, all of a sudden, you, you, you're taking a look at what you really did, why you really did it, and then you have a sense of what I need to do to be more like Him. Same thing happens in the workplace. We do all kinds of stuff for self-centered, selfish motives. And we shouldn't be bummed out about that because we're fallen men and women. And that's why we have the gospel of Jesus Christ to help us turn, not just for church, not just in our callings, but in the workplace. I've been going for a long time. I'll be quiet. No, that, that's, <laughs> that's not true. That's, that's, uh, there's a good question right here. I don't what know where this? this is from, but it says, it sometimes feels like God's blessings or love are conditional. At the same time, we say his love is unconditional. How to navigate that seeming contraction and help others, uh, help ourselves, our employees, our missionaries to feel the unconditional love instead of beating themselves or ourselves up with the notion of not doing enough or retrieving enough to get the conditional love or blessings? Okay, now uh, I'm going to blow some people up here. Nowhere. Anywhere in the scriptures does it say that God's love is unconditional. It is infinite. It is eternal. But unconditional is a psychological term. And don't bring psychology into an understanding of the gospel. When we obtain any blessing from God, it is by obedience to the law upon which it is predicated. Then we move to, well, I must not be doing it right. Line upon line, precept upon precept. And another consideration is that sometimes we establish the timeline for I expect this blessing and I want it at this time. I don't think that's submissive. Submissive is I'm totally willing to wait as long as it takes and I will accept it in whatever form it comes. We, I think, too often speak in the culture of the church about I'm going to get an answer and I'm going to get it quickly. And somehow we're frustrated if we've knelt, we've prayed, we've asked, and the big answer didn't come all at once. They come line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little over longer periods of time than we would want. So to be submissive is to not impose your own outcome and timeline, but to wait upon the Lord. Mm. Take that phrase and don't do a computer keyword search and find every one of them in the scriptures, but read the standard works looking for those phrases. Wait upon the Lord. Nephi had to go three times to get the brass plates. Was something wrong with him the first time? I don't think so. Was something wrong with him the second time? I don't think so. I think the first two episodes were necessary for him to go the third time submissive 
and willing to do whatever the Lord instructed to be able to get them. He was not wrong the first two times. He was being tutored on how to do it right the third time. Does that come anywhere close? Yeah. So let, uh, if I could uh, just play off of that one. So Elder Bednar, I think everybody knows that you are big on we learn by experience. Yes. Okay. It says that someplace. It says, We're supposed it to learn from our own experience, <laughs> the good from the evil. But I, but I know that that's the thing for you. You taught us over the years about what lack I yet, what must I do, and therefore what, you know, the whole process, whatever. But we're all going to walk away from here saying, okay, I, I think I have a better understanding from my preparations, the promptings of the Spirit, about what meekness is. I want it. For but how it gets served up and how we learn it in, by going through this experience, you've got to help us to understand because I, I, you know, if there, anybody's like me, I get really impatient, I'm not getting there, whatever. What counsel, what, what would you give us in terms of this experience of developing the spiritual gift? Well, I've given a little in that the, the yearning has to be not because I want it. Sometimes, I may just be revealing some of my own things, but sometimes we want to have that, those gifts so that we can flaunt them. And we want to have those so that other people will think really highly of us and say, wow, that's really a spiritual guy. Well, um, that can't be the reason. So it's got to be because if God could use me, and he helped me get to the right place at the right time, then if the gift came to me, I wouldn't try to hang on to it. I would just be the conduit so it would come through and bless other people. I think that's the, the crux of the issue. And that, that ever-increasing purity of motive can only come through the strengthening power and grace of the Savior's atonement. We alone can't do that. He can scrub us. Uh, I had an experience when I was the president of BYU-Idaho, and President Eyring, Elder Eyring at the time, was staying at our home. And uh, at breakfast one morning, he said, uh, I was rebuked last night by the Holy Ghost. And we tend to think that rebuke is a harsh thing, like getting yelled at. Rebuked is just seeing things as they really are and being corrected. And then he looked at me and he said, Brother Bednar, if you haven't been rebuked by the Holy Ghost lately, you need to improve your prayers. Now, you got to think about that one for a while. That goes back to the Holy Ghost will help you see things as they really are. And that's, to me, uh, that's how you do that. It's tutoring from heaven that is both painful and liberating and edifying. What did I miss? Now, is it fair to say that there's a little bit of two steps forward and one step back? You know, that uh, I've been... In almost everything. Almost everything. We, we think that we, we follow three steps and I'll be there in 19 days. This is a lifelong pursuit. And consecration is the capstone covenant of the temple. And meekness is perhaps the capstone characteristic of the Savior. Uh, we're not going to develop that in three easy steps. And so the, the crashing and burning in the process of trying to learn this is part of the necessary pattern through which we go to be able to learn from our own experience. Okay, we got questions here. Let's let's see whether you know how. What is meekness? How do we do it? Whatever. Let's, let's microphones stand up, and then we've got several hands. Let's hear what you have to say. I'm interested in, um, you know, you call you referenced um, Mormon's teaching his son about the role of meekness, and that it's foundational in your conference talk. Uh, and then you just mentioned meekness as kind of the pinnacle of personal development. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about, in, in terms of sequencing that you referenced before, where does meekness come? I mean, it, it feels like I can't develop charity without first developing 
meekness. And it also, it also feels like it's a, a key to unlock barriers between myself and heaven. It's a relationship healer. It has a lot of different um, roles. So can it rightly be said that if I'm trying to develop something personally, regardless of what it is, that that pursuit should begin with kind of an assessment of my own kind of meekness and where I stand that way? Let me give a, a, a briefer answer and then you respond, okay? Uh, there's a big fancy word in statistics called multicollinearity. Now, let me explain what that means. If you're doing a research project and you have this thing that you're trying to figure out, you can have 10 variables that impact this thing. But statistics don't do a good job of unraveling the 10 things. You can identify one thing, one thing, one thing, but the simultaneous impact of all 10, it's kind of hard to figure that out. That's called multicollinearity, okay? In mortality, we are sequential. We think about things in sequences. And so our question is, well, if I'm doing meekness, then where does that do with charity? They're all happening at the same time. You can't be striving appropriately for meekness and not also being blessed with an increase in the spiritual gift of charity and of faith. So I wouldn't try to think about it in terms of there's nine of them and what's the sequence necessarily. I just go for it and they're all going to be enlarged. What'd you hear in that? I, what I heard is, is that if I, I mean, meekness underlays everything. It can't be foundational unless it's always there. And I can remodel my home. I can re-roof the, the, the roof and I can do a lot of different things to that home, but the foundation remains. And it feels to me from what you've said that regardless of where I'm working to develop myself and improve relationships and things like that, the foundation of meekness, if it's lacking, is going to undermine those efforts. Yeah, let, let's go back to one other illustration. How many of us, when we entered, when we accepted the covenant of consecration, knew what we were getting into? I don't think we did. But over time, it kind of distills upon you. You have experiences in your life. And then all of a sudden, your eyes, the eyes of your understanding are enlarged. And you go, okay, I understand this a little more and a little more and a little more. See, that's the same thing. Our meekness is, I shouldn't say our meekness. The gift of meekness is coming to us incrementally as we're working on all of those things, as we're trying to understand humility. And we all, we all have to pretend to be humble at first because we're not. And we're not disingenuous. It's just that we're in that process of being transformed from a natural man or a natural woman into a man or woman of Christ. And over time, line upon line, precept upon precept, we don't have to think about it as much. There are instances where you have to think about how you're supposed to behave as a good Latter-day Saint because that isn't what I would normally do. But the more we learn, the more we practice, if you will, the more it changes our heart through the Savior's grace. And ultimately, we become that. It's not something that we have to calculate, think about, put on a to-do list. Increasingly, it just becomes what we are. That's why I think President Nelson, I don't think he was that way when he was 20, but if, whenever I use that example, I'm absolutely positive he couldn't imagine why I was using his, him as an example because he has become that. Does that make any sense at all? It, it does. It does. We have to exhibit the behavior sometimes before the internal. To get started. Yeah, before you cleanse the inner vessel by That's right. what you're doing sometimes. And see, I think that is precisely what we learned in the episode with Nephi, where he tries it once, he tries it twice, third time it works a lot better. That's what we're doing. We just have to be careful not to think that somehow we're responsible for the success. We are enlarged because of the Savior's atoning sacrifice as we accept the principles and ordinances of the gospel 
and exercise our agency to receive the ordinances and covenants, and then remember and live and honor those covenants. That opens not the windows of heaven, the doors of heaven, so the power of godliness can come into our life, and that's what transforms us. That's where it goes from behavior modification to what we become. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you. We have other questions right here. Jake. <clears throat> I appreciated your comment on how we need to learn uh, more about the nature of God, that, that is, uh, that's one of the keys to, to, to educating ourselves and building our testimony. And, uh, but in learning more about God, uh, it, we, it's uh, an issue that in my church employment has been mentioned, you know, who are we talking about? You know, our Heavenly Father, our Savior Jesus Christ, or the, or the Holy Ghost. And, and the, the, the best resource that's ever been recommended to me was a, a talk from Elder McConkie that he gave at BYU back in the 70s, where he defined 16 or 17 different natures or attributes or roles for, for God, different, different members of the Godhead. How would you suggest we go about learning the nature of God? Um, two sources. One is the instruction in the temple. And two is uh, everything you find in the standard works about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, what I'm about to say, you all already all know. But yet, brand new scriptures, inexpensive ones, and read looking for those specific things. What do I find about the members of the Godhead? Uh, for example, the Holy Ghost always entices and invites. Those are two characteristic words used in relation to the Holy Ghost. Have you been in church and you hear people say, I'm going to challenge you to do this? That's what salespeople do. Don't bring tactics from secular occupations into an understanding of the gospel. The Holy Ghost never challenges anybody, but he invites and he entices. So you find characteristics like that. Another one that's obvious to everybody, the father, Adam, where art thou? Now we know he knows everything. Doesn't he know where Adam is? So why does he ask the question? Because Adam doesn't know where he is. Can you see Adam hiding under a bush someplace? And he hears the question. And he says, well, this is kind of dumb. I'm trying to hide from father. And he comes out. If you want to know how to deal with children, that is the perfect example. Now, what do most dads do? Adam, get out of there. Rah, rah, rah. And you lecture the kid for 10 minutes. And you've given him the same lecture 1,500 times, and it didn't do any good, but if I yell at him a little louder this time, it'll probably work. See, that's, that tells you something about him as a father and the characteristics. He asks a lot of questions. He listens. He guides. He doesn't command. So if you take unmarked scriptures in whatever form, Erase all the stuff on your, on your uh, app and just go through and ask, seek, and knock with that question in mind. Then the Holy Ghost tutors you in a powerful way to see things in the scriptures that have always been there, but you've never seen. Thank you. Great question. Hey, following along with that, Elder Bednar, it, it, this comment here that came in is, is suffering a prerequisite to meekness? Is Holy suffering... Yeah. Well, I'd back off a little bit and say experiences, and we suffer through a lot of experiences, so the answer I would say is yes. Do you have an ex example of that, personal or just sure. any other? Have you ever been right, and you found out you were wrong, <laughs> and you injured somebody because you were so sure you were right, but you were wrong? That's agony. I listened to President Packer uh, just anguish over, not mistakes, but things where he had just come to a, an incomplete, inaccurate conclusion. 
to this day, when I was a missionary, uh, I served with the mission president, and it was at a time when we were preparing for one of the area conferences. It was in Munich. And uh, so he, for a period of time, because we had no stakes then, he was very busy doing that, and he gave us responsibility for a lot of things with the missionaries. So I went out and worked with a, a whole bunch of missionaries in a particular zone, and there was one elder that uh, just seemed kind of befuddled, and he'd been serving for a long time. And uh, when we got all done, I just said, Elder, you know, we've kind of been going around in circles here today. And so we talked about, you know, how you have a productive day and on and on and on. And uh, I wrote an evaluation of my experience with this elder and gave it to the mission president, which he used in an interview with this elder. And the president called me in and he said, Elder Bednar, I want you to finish this interview. And uh, I had crushed this elder in this evaluation. And the mission president trusted my evaluation, just crushed him. And he's going home in like six weeks. To this day, that's agonizing. Now, we took some steps. My companion, who was in the office at the time, went out and worked with him. But I could have destroyed this man. And had it not been for the work of my companion, who went out into the field to help heal the wounds, I don't know what the outcome would have been. Uh, I agonize that telling you this story right now. So that's not the only way. You don't have to, I'm not saying that's all there is and that brings meekness, but that's a part of the equation. It's not the whole equation. Okay. Is that responsive to your yeah. question? Mm -hmm. Okay. A few more hands. If we can go back to the idea or the principle that meekness encompasses an, a turning outward, um, is there a point within the realm of meekness at which we can give ourselves a break? So let me give you an example of, of what I'm talking about. Um, so I, I suffer from severe depression, and I don't know if you've ever experienced it or know someone who does, but at times depression can actually cut you off from the spirit. And so thinking of the example that you gave us about Christ and how when he was spiritually and physically spent, he was still able to think about someone else. And so I think of that in terms of mortality and being just a human and not a God. Is there a time when it's okay that I am so far from the spirit and so physically, emotionally, and spiritually spent that it's okay to not turn outward? Or would you, th would you say that that is still the best remedy, I suppose, for feeling that feeling? Let me, hold on, let's try something here. If you feel like you're cut off from the spirit, you already know the things to try to invite it back. Uh, let's not go to the turn outward, but is it possible to do those things? It is possible. In my personal experience, when I have felt sort of just alone in, yeah. in whatever I'm going through, I have looked for ways to serve, even if it's just to like text someone or something like that, something that's a little bit easier so I don't have to be face to face. I have prayed, I have gone to the temple, um, I have done, I've studied my scriptures and really reached out to God and asked for help in understanding. And no, I haven't felt any relief or any closeness to the spirit through those exercises. Now, I think you'll find my answer very dissatisfying. And that is, even though you don't, just be consistent and keep doing it. Um, it's not in a, a single episode or even two or three. It's in the consistency. So if you're able in those circumstances, I'm trying to say this very discreetly because I don't know what that's like. And so I don't have the ability to tell you what to do. 
But if you have the capacity, you know what to do. If you can do it, even though it doesn't seem to be producing the fruit that you want, you know that it will over time if you can just press forward. I'm really relying on that press forward with a steadfastness in Christ. As you do that, you receive strength beyond your own. Now, help me know what you heard in that. Is that just to Sunday school or? No, it's, I mean, it's Sunday school for sure, but I really feel like some of the more simple Sunday school answers are the ones that we need. And, and I ask you this question sort of with an answer in mind already a little bit, just a little bit. Um, sure, I think that I have survived some of my worst bouts of depression because I read my scriptures or because I reached out to God and I think that whatever strength or power came to me was just unseen and unfelt in those moments. But I, I believe that God is good and so I believe that he didn't just leave me to myself in those situations. And so, yes, I do. I'm curious, though, um, if what you're saying is reading the scriptures and reaching out to God, is that a way of turning outward? Is that a, an expression of, of outward? Sure. And so would that be in those cases, if that's all I can do is to pray and to reach out to God, that's, an, that's, a, that's a turning outward. Yeah, if that's all you can do, that's, those are good things to do. Remember, faith in the Savior is a principle of action and of power. If you are capable of acting and doing the simple things you already know, it brings power, but not on your timetable and perhaps not in the way you want, but it will come. You can always depend upon that. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Another one right here. Okay. Elder Bednar, uh, several years ago, you gave a conference address where you told the story of your good friend that took the truck into the mountain yeah. and uh, cut firewood uh, because he was stuck and thought, well, we'll try one last time to take the truck out and was able to then move forward. And you stated that it was the load and stated that a number of times in the address. And I wonder if you have any tips on ways in which we can avoid the tipping point where meekness becomes a weakness because we've allowed the load to perhaps not just be weight that gives us friction and traction, but can become a, a crushing load. H how do you detect where that is and, and avoid stepping over that, that tipping point? Say that last part again. You used a, an adjective for the load, and I couldn't quite understand that. Where, where the load becomes a crushing load, uh -huh. where it becomes too much, not, not enough to simply give you traction, but more than you can bear. Is, is there a point at which you should watch yourself, watch your, uh, you know, your emotions, watch the circumstance of maybe trying to take on too many things, uh, tips you have in that, uh, that regard. Uh, what I can suggest is a principle. This goes back to something that uh, Ben said a little bit earlier about we, we get impatient, we want to do the, all of these God-like things very quickly. And the principle is line upon line, precept upon precept. We don't have a governor, but uh, we have to be aware of our capacity. There are some things that we have to postpone, some things we may need to say no for the time being. And as we as we are consistent, then we get help to discern and recognize what those things are that perhaps need to be delayed a bit or uh, that we would do less of. So the only tip is a principle. The, the primary pattern for our growth is line upon line, precept upon precept. And sometimes in our impatience, we try to do too much, too fast. Part of seeing things as they really are is helping to regulate that a little bit in the judgments that we make. Did you hear anything in that? Hopefully not what I said, but did you hear anything in that or did I just miss that? No, I, I appreciate that. 
appreciate the comment. Thank you. It was, no, I heard that, about the, the help, uh, help me know what helped in that, if anything. I, I think the comments about the in being, avoiding impatience and about uh, giving time are things that are uh, of great importance. Uh, waiting for the waiting upon the Lord, waiting for His time frame and and His uh, His sequence of things. That sounds so easy when we sit in a room like this and we talk about it, but when the the reality of day to day life is pounding on us, yeah, it's a lot harder to try to put that into into practice. Yeah. I, I don't know if that if I I sure hope the Holy Ghost is helping you more than I did with that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't know that our, we're running out of time here, but I, okay. I, I think this is a question. Uh, just want to go back to the workplace here. So as somebody texted in, being meek in the workplace is difficult. To be successful in the workplace, I feel like I need to be loud, make it known that I am an expert in my field and that I can accomplish the work. I feel that pressure even more as a woman in a workforce that is predominantly full of men where it is already difficult to be seen. I recognize that that isn't exhibiting meekness. How can I progress in my career while being meek? You're the HR director. I knew you were going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> but I would defer to you. You taught me to defer to you. But I'm presiding. <laughs> oh, goodness. I guess I would, uh, yeah, I, I think this will be wholly unacceptable to whoever asked this question. I spent my entire professional career outside of church employment before I went to BYU-Idaho. So I was in secular institutions of higher education and secular organizations for my consulting work and all that kind of stuff. When I went to Rexburg, uh, they said, we have a faculty temple trip that we do. And so everybody on the faculty went to the temple. And I said, that's against the law. We can't do that, can we? Because of how you just get battered in secular institutions of higher education if you mention anything religious. And it was unbelievably liberating to me to be in a place where you could mention the gospel, teach gospel principles uh, in connection with your academic discipline or in the way you were running the university. Whenever President Hinckley uh, called and said, we're going to change Rick's College into a four-year university, and I said, yes, sir, what would you have me do? And he said, well, make it happen. That was it. There was no strategic plan, nothing. That was it. And the first illustration I gave to the faculty and the staff was uh, new wine and old bottles and what happens. And you get arrested if you do that at a secular institution. All of that is a preface to say there should be some differences uh, working in the organization of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I would argue uh, that we should be able to recognize meekness. Now, that may seem to contradict what I said earlier, that you can't recognize it, but you can, it's not weak. It's not just, well, this person doesn't seem to participate. If they participate and they hit it out of the ballpark whenever they do participate, you can pretty quickly come to understand that this person is just trying to contribute and not show off. I think that does have a chance to be recognized here. We're not as good as we could and should be, but I think this is a place where that can happen. It does happen. It just needs to happen more. Now, Bednar, I think that um for that individual who desires to be meek and doesn't always get seen or whatever, I don't know if they'll ever, you know, not ever, but may not get the answer that they like. But if all of us were striving to be more meek, where we was less about us and more about other people, listening more rather than speaking, 
more or less about ourselves, then I think those people would show up more, you know? And so I think it's not only behooves individuals to improve, but it behooves us as a workforce to work on that. And as we do, I think we'll then recognize more people who are meek and what they have to bring to the party. There have been uh, several members of the Quorum of the Twelve and their ongoing legacy is summarized in this phrase. Uh, Elder Hunter, Howard W. Hunter, didn't speak often, but when he did, everybody listened. And I don't know if we're judges of this, but I think President Hunter was a remarkable example of meekness. James E. Faust, same thing was always said about him. Um, when he spoke, people listened, but he wasn't interested in having just airtime. And there was something in both of those men that you could sense. Uh, maybe that becomes one of the indicators. There's a, a distinguishing spirit that attends the spiritual gift of meekness. That same thing is true if you, you know, I've had a chance for, what, 20 years to work with organization leaders. And uh, there, are, there are women who manifest this spiritual gift in miraculous ways. So the common denominator between those members of the 12 and the organization leaders with whom I've worked is that there's just, you can't define it. I'm not sure it's describable, but it is distinguishable. You can, you can sense it. Okay. So Elder Bednar, um, we're getting, it just went by too quickly. Uh, we're getting to the end here. So um, I have a question before you go where you're going. Okay. Have we gotten anywhere close today? You want me to answer that? Yeah. Okay. I think that what this session has done for me, and I'm going to assume for everyone else, is it's reinforced what we learned in our preparations. And so I think the answer is yes. There is certainly new le learning, but as I'm listening to what has been said here, I've just reflected on what I've gone through over the last six months or so and realized, oh my goodness, you know, you're basically reaffirming what I've gone through and kind of what I've, I've experienced. Just one thing, I'm not. The Holy Ghost is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we haven't done any damage. I don't know that we've helped anybody, but hopefully we haven't done any damage to what they received <laughs> while they were preparing. Yeah. So I have one last question. I know that Sister Derringer will be offering the closing prayer when we're finished, but I do want to give a few minutes for you to any wrap up comments, counsel, testimony, and what have you. But I, if I might, just do it in a, a, a way by telling a little bit of a story. Um, a bunch of years ago, uh, I got caught in some business uh, over the weekend uh, in uh, uh, Brussels, Belgium. Didn't have much to do, so I decided to go to a um, museum. And I went to this museum, don't remember the name of it, it was huge, and it had large quarters uh, of paintings from the first, second, third century and what have you. And I went down one corridor that was all about pictures of Christ. Admittedly, a lot of them were pictures of Christ in his agony on the cross. But I went through it and I'm going, oh my goodness, oh, where did that come from? And where did that come from or whatever? And I got on the plane on the way back and I thought to myself, if I had an easel put in front of me and given a set of brushes, whatever, some paint, the question was, is that from my own experiences, my impression or impressions that had come to me, how would I paint the Savior based upon those experiences? And I thought about that many years. And every time I have a significant experience, like through repentance or whatever, I feel like I better understand who he is. And if I were to paint him, You know, that things would come out based upon that. And so I just wanted to leave you with one question. And 
leave it to however, and that would be as it, Elder Bednar, from your experiences, the impressions that have come to you. How would you paint the Savior? I would uh, rely on two scriptural episodes of, as the foundation of my painting. One is uh, as the Savior comes out of the garden, he's been betrayed by Judas and the guards come to take him away. I'm not sure we often remember that he has just come from the garden. Peter, in his exuberance, cuts off the ear of one of the guards and Jesus heals him. He's been betrayed by one of his apostles. He has suffered agony so extreme that he has sweat drops of blood from every pore. And this man has a, an injured ear. I said this in the talk, but the very power that he could have used to uh, reject and resist and overpower the guards, he used to heal one of them. That's him. The first word uh, spoken in this dispensation was Joseph's name. The Savior at the temple in the land of Bountiful invited 2,500 people to come forward one by one, uno por uno, to feel that the wounds in his hands and in his side and in his feet. That's the same day that he blessed all the children. And if that experience, if each of those 2,500 people took 30 seconds, eight, 10, 12 hours, and then that same day, he blessed the children one by one. That's him. I don't know how you represent that in a portrait, but it's that individual. It's that personal. This is not about abstractions. It's not about congregations. It's not about groups. It's not even about stakes and wards. It's about individuals one by one. The greatest joy of my life is to now be on his errand and represent him, not to go to Argentina to preside at a conference, but to find ones. He, he orchestrates intersections with individuals. Uh, and how he does that, I don't understand. But an apostle can be sent all the way around the world to find a one, because that's him. That's how his work is accomplished, because that's how he does the work. Is that at all responsive to your question? Yeah. Now, do I get to bear my testimony now? Okay. Before I bear my testimony, Ben, on behalf of the First Presidency and the Twelve, we thank you for all that you have done. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I bear witness in the authority of the Holy Apostleship that Jesus the Christ lives. He is the resurrected and living Son of the Eternal Father. He is our Savior and our Redeemer. And there are many things I don't know, but I know, I testify, and I witness that He lives. This is the living Church of Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ lives. My prayer and even the blessing that I would invoke upon all who have prepared so well 
and participated in such an earnest way in what's taking place today is that they can be patient with themselves, wait upon the Lord, and know that He knows them as a one, and the blessings that they yearn for and desire will come in His way at His time. They will come. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the outpouring of thy spirit, which has been felt here this day. We thank thee for the opportunity to learn at the feet of one of thy living apostles and for the restoration of the gospel and the priesthood power that makes that possible. Father, we are so aware of the pain and suffering so many are experiencing at this time. And we pray that as we go forward this day and continue to strive to become more like Thee and to develop meekness and to look outward, that we may be prompted and how we can spread thy good word of peace to those around us. And we pray that we will have the enabling power of the atonement and to, to fill it in our lives, that we will have the strength and courage to act upon those promptings. Father, we again thank thee for the countless blessings that we are filling our lives. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.